So the second of these pillars was the systems or holistic approach to biology. And how do we, how do we think about that? Well, a simple analogy is, say, let's suppose that you're an engineer and you were really interested in understanding how a radio wave converted electromagnetic waves into sound waves. How might you go about uh, gaining uh, that information? So the first thing you do is you take the radio apart, you study the individual parts, and you determine what those individual parts could do. And that's what biology has done really for the last 40 years, studying individual or a few genes or proteins at a time. But what you also know is if you stopped there, you wouldn't have the faintest idea how the radio worked. Rather, what you need to do next, then, is put those parts together in their circuits and come to understand how individually the circuits and their integrated circuits carry out this conversion of uh, uh, electromagnetic to sound waves. And that's exactly what happens in living organisms through the biological networks that we've talked about already. So in the area of systems biology, then, I would make a couple of points. One, it takes a holistic approach towards studying the system. It wants to look at all of the different components. And number two, it's really important to be able to take the information you have about a system, formulate a model, create hypotheses to test the model, and then you perturb the system to test those hypotheses. You do this in an integrative manner until you bring your data into apposition with your model. And of course, what's really important about models is that they be, number one, predictive, and number two, in the case of medicine, actionable. So what that means is your model tells you something about the patient you can use to improve their lives. And of course, what systems biology does is it looks at the data in a peculiar way exactly as I described the root Goldberg apparatus. You need to look globally at the components. You need to look at how they're uh, connected one to another. And you need to look at their data. So that's really all that systems biology is about. But it is about a great deal more because systems biology must necessarily sit on a cross-disciplinary environment because its fundamental conviction is there, there are three stools to this systems biology uh, trilogy, if you will. The biology, again, drives the need to develop new technologies, and they, in turn, drive the need to develop new mathematical and computational tools. So you need to have a cross-disciplinary environment with all the scientists you see uh, at the lower right-hand uh, side there. And what is really important is they need to learn to speak one another's language, and they need to be able to work together effectively in teams. And this is a learned exercise. Most academics certainly don't operate in that manner. But the other thing that I think is really important to stress, and it's something that we've done very successfully at the Institute for Systems Biology, is we've democratized systems biology in that every scientist at the Institute has the ability to use the data generation tools and the data analysis tools to carry out big or small science. And we'll talk later about what we mean exactly by big and small science. So how do we think about medicine from the systems biology point of view? Well, it's the idea that in the diseased organ there are one or more biological networks that become disease perturbed. This alters the patterns of information expression in those organs, and it does so dynamically during the progression of the disease. And it's those older patterns of information that, on the one hand, explain the pathophysiology of the disease, and on the other hand, they give you new insights into diagnosis therapy and even into prevention. And we'll end up talking about all of those before I'm finished. I'll give you one example. We've studied for six years now neurologic disease in mice induced by 
uh, infecting them in the brain with an infectious protein. And we've analyzed uh, the information in the brain, and we've been able to map the information changes that occurred in diseased animals in the brain in terms of four major biological networks we knew about uh, uh, as a cause of this disease from histopathologic studies. So we can map the networks out where red indicates where uh, the diseased animals have had some changes. And the results of these studies were really remarkable. Number one, we were able to demonstrate that the four major networks became disease perturbed in a sequential fashion. Now, why is that important? It's important because if you want to think about therapy or diagnosis, you want to look at the most proximal network. If you can make that normal, then everything downstream in principle can be normal. Number two, we were able to identify a core of about 300 genes responsible for neurodegeneration, and we were able to demonstrate, interestingly enough, two-thirds of them mapped into the four major networks. The other third mapped into six networks. No one had any idea we were a part of this disease, and that's the importance of doing global analyses. And the final point I would make is that those networks, when analyzed collectively, explained virtually every aspect of the pathophysiology of that disease. So for the first time, we're gaining really detailed mechanistic insights into a fundamental disease uh, in humans. And finally, what it did was give us some really interesting insights into thinking about biomarkers that could give us insights into this particular disease. And the fundamental idea that uh, came out of this type of thinking is that we can make blood a window that can survey health and disease for any organ that we wish. And the idea was we were able to demonstrate that uh, most organs we examined have proteins that are organ-specific, only made in that organ. Some of those proteins get secreted into the blood, and there they constitute a fingerprint, in this case, say, for the brain. So if you have a normal brain, those 100 proteins we've identified will be set at one level of concentrations. But if you have a diseased brain, those proteins whose cognate networks have become disease perturbed will change their levels. And since every disease disease perturbs different combinations of networks, there'll be a unique fingerprint for each different disease. So the blood can then distinguish health from disease, uh, and if disease, which disease do you have? And in fact, we've gone on to demonstrate that these blood, organ-specific blood protein markers can, one, do early detection. We can detect that disease eight weeks before you see any clinical signs. Number two, we can stratify the disease. We can look at two different types of neurodegenerative disease and from the blood say which is which. Number three, we can follow beautifully the successive perturbation of the disease perturbed networks so we know precisely where the patient is at a particular point in time. What we demonstrated, but certainly will work, is that these markers can also look at the response to therapy and the recurrence of the disease. So let's then uh, uh, move into the next arena. And that arena is uh, thinking about new technologies that open up uh, new areas of uh, patient data space. And I'll tell you about studies we began just a little more than a year ago uh, on analyzing uh, family genome sequences. These were done uh, by um, complete genomics, so we outsourced uh, this very important set of sequences, and they, I will say, did a very uh, superior job. And the first family we looked at was really an interesting one. The two parents were normal, the two kids each had the same two uh, genetic diseases. So the question we initially asked was, can we use family genome sequencing to identify candidate disease genes 
for these two diseases. And in fact, it turned out we could do far more. Number one, simply by using the principles of Mendelian genetics within the family sequences, we could correct 70% of the sequencing errors. And if you have a family of six, you can correct close to 90% of the sequencing errors. Number two, we could identify rare variants because if it was a rare variant, two or more members of the family had it, uh, and that means it couldn't be a, a sequencing error. And number three, we were able to assign for each of the diploid chromosomes the order of uh, particular alleles that were present for any, all the genes. And it, this constellation of alleles is called haplotypes. And I'll say without going into any uh, justification, haplotypes in the future are going to be incredibly important for medicine. We could, we could actually figure out the intergenerational mutation rates. So in this family, each of the kids had 35 mutations that differentiated them from their two parents. And then, of course, we were indeed able to identify four candidate genes on three chromosomes, and their assignment was a pretty straightforward process for the gene that caused each of the diseases. So what this means is we think with family genome sequencing, we can identify most simple Mendelian traits quite easily. Right now, what we're doing is looking at diseases where we know the disease gene, but we're looking for modifiers. For example, we're looking at Huntington's disease, where we know the disease gene, but some patients in a family will get the disease early in the 30s, and others will get it late in the 70s. We'd like to find the disease gene that forces the late onset, and wouldn't it be great, even if we can't cure it, we could move everyone to the late onset for Huntington's, and we're making progress in that regard. We think we can actually use family genome sequencing for complex genetic diseases like Alzheimer's. And to do that, we have to stratify the disease, Alzheimer's, into its different types, and I'll tell you just how we plan to do that in just a moment. And my prediction, again, is in 10 years or less, almost all of you will have your genome sequence as a fundamental part of your medical record. It'll be a key part of the billions of uh, data points that we're uh, talking about. A second area that ISP has been interested in is the Human Proteome Project, which is akin to the Human Genome Project. And the first endeavor in, in carrying out a Human Proteome Project is to democratize the proteins just as the human genome democratized genes. By democratize, I mean make all of the genes, or in our case, all of the proteins accessible to any biologist. So ISP has actually developed the computational tools to, uh, to be able to do this, creating uh, an analytic pipeline that allows you to assess the a quality of mass spec data, that's what we're talking about here, and a database that allows you to store it. And then we've uh, developed, in collaboration through the Eversol, the ETH, targeted genomics that allow us to analyze two to 400 proteins in an hour quantitatively, very effectively. And more recently, Rob Moritz at ISD has created assays for all 20,000 some human proteins that are now in an accessible database. So if you want to analyze proteins, they are uh, available for you at this point in time. 